I will bless the Lord at all times. Start again. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Our affirmation of faith. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own way, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own word. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Father, again, we thank you so much for this, your holy Sabbath day. We thank you for your mercies, your grace, and your compassion that has spared us even in this moment in time. We pray, Lord, for this church, for the, your people, your children. We pray a special blessing and anointing upon everyone within the hearing of my voice. That, Lord, that we will come to you in spirit and truth, seeking truth for ourselves in the times in which we live, in the times happening all around us right now. And as we would get, Lord, to give us faith, give us strength, give us hope in Jesus. We ask all these things in the name, in the magical name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen, 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 amen. You may be seated, beloved. Oh, it's good to see you today. It's good to see you today. I don't know. Let me check. I feel like new money. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what I was battling last week, but um, when I woke up on, it was either Thursday or Friday, and it no longer felt like my chest was full of whatever and I wasn't coughing anymore. I said, oh, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Um, 
one day, quick testimony, one day, I'm not sure what was going on, but I got up, and when I, on my way to the restroom, my legs started hurting me, and no matter which way I turned, it wouldn't stop hurting, and I was like, oh my goodness, what's going on? And so I got back to the room, and I'm sitting there, and, and I... You lay down, you twist this way, you twist that way, you wrap your leg around your head. Nothing was working. And it was getting worse and worse. I'm like, Jesus, what's going on here? And uh, I said, okay, you know what? I, I, I got to stop and pray on this one. So I started calling out to the Lord. And brethren, don't you know, when I talk to the Lord, that thing stopped hurting? All I know is, all I know is, all I know is, you crazy if you don't talk to him about your trouble. Because he's a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. Now, I don't know what made it start hurting, but I know what helped it stop hurting. And that was all I was caring about. We want to give a shout out to our Bible Bowl teams. Y'all know I had to be sick if I missed Bible Bowl. I want to give a shout out to our Bible Bowl teams. And, um, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, but it was built. And this church is in the process of building uh, some very robust, robust, robust Bible Bowl teams. And I, I love it because you, you get all bathed up in the Word of God like that, and it just does something for you. It does something for you. When you're studying for Bible Bowl, you get better grades in school. You can't be that intimate with the Word of God and not have it impact all the different areas of your life. So I want to give a shout out to our teams. The next round is going to be May 4. I'm, I'm not sure if it's going to be at Lebanon or where it's going to be, but I think we are off to a great start. We're going the right direction. And uh, before you know it, Queensboro will be synonymous with Bible Bowl, and Bible Bowl will be synonymous with Queensboro. Well, the wife is away this weekend, but I send you her greetings. And um, I think this is the first Sabbath in a little bit that we haven't gotten rained on. So I'm thankful to God for that. But what that means, uh, we have some work to do. We have some work to do. We have some work to do. We got to get out uh, into our community. We got to let the folks know what's coming. I have a secret for you. I have a secret for you. I have a secret for you. There are people, the only reason, the only reason, the only reason they have not visited this church yet is because you didn't invite them. That's it. You would be amazed how many people walk by this building and would love to come see what's going on, but in their minds, if they're not invited, they can't come. So when we go out and we're knocking on doors and we're telling people about what's going on, you, you have no clue. There are folks, I, I remember when we did doctor in the house, and I got this from one of the people in the community. She said, I'm so glad you knocked on my door and gave me this fly. She said, that's why I'm here. So I don't want us to underestimate the power of promoting all the good things that the church is doing. Because I had another neighbor tell us, he said, man, y'all are doing some good stuff. Please, the next thing y'all got, go and tell me, let me know, let me know. I don't want to miss out. So we can't sit here getting fat on the gospel goodness and don't share the goodness with the folks around us. And um, when you hear we have fly distribution or we're knocking on doors, please, 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 let's uh, be all hands on deck so that we can, we can get going. Is there anybody that would need a smoke detector in their house, preferably one you don't have to pay for? Let me see your hands. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, so here's the deal. Here's why I asked that question. Sister Cook is one of our resource people, and she has reached out. And she let me know that there is a resource you can call, and 
they will uh, come and install the smoke detectors for you. They're not even going to make you do it. They'll come do it for you. And I know it's true because I had this done in my house a couple of years ago. They came and just put them almost in every room. Anywhere I pointed, they put one up. I'm going to give you this telephone number. And if you need to have smoke detectors put up in your house, I want you to call this number. Because at this point, <clears throat> at this stage of the game, there should not be anyone without smoke detectors in their house. They are just that important. So here we go. 718-718-718. The preacher said 718-281-281-281-281. He said 718-281-281. 3875 3875 718 281 3875. Give them a call. Give them a call. The fire department has this service where um, they will come and do it for you. And like I said, I know it's true because I had it done a few years ago, both for me and for my mother in law who lives next door. This is very important, beloved. This is very important. Uh, the life you save could be your own. And um, do you ever notice how hard it is for people at Queensboro to die? I, 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 I asked Jesus to make this environment to be such that you just are so joyful in the Lord that it's hard for you to die. I have been here over two years now. I can count on one hand with fingers left over the amount of folks that we have had to funeralize. And that's not a coincidence. That's not a coincidence. I, I have a conversation with the Lord about stuff like this. I told you about what happened at my last assignment. And so I thank God for his keeping power in your life. I thank God that when I walk in here, I can look at the back and I can see Brother Johnson sitting next to his girlfriend, Sister Johnson, and Sister Johnson making Google eyes at Brother Johnson. I like that. I, I like being able to walk in here, and even though, um, by the way, is, is, Brother, is Elder Clark out of the hospital yet? Okay, I was sick, so I couldn't go see him. I didn't want to give him anything else to worry about. Amen. But I like walking in here at Sabbath school time, and, and Elder Clark is, is sitting back there, and you know he's going to have a good comment. You know you just, just walked his way with the microphone because you know he got something good to say. I like walking in here and, 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 and looking around and, and seeing the saints. By now, I pretty much know who sits where. And so when I don't see you on Sabbath morning, I, I say, all right, Jesus, where are they, Lord? Everything all right? Everything good? But I want you to know, I want you to know that it's intentional that this be a place that when you come here, you leave feeling good. I want you to be able to show up for service and, and know that you're going to have an encounter with the Lord. And I want the experience to be so good that you just don't want to leave here. You just want to hang out and you just want to stay around. Now, do you know, do you know what's in here? I'm going to tell you what's in here. A chair is in here. Now you said, Pastor Brown, how you fit a chair in that little envelope? Okay, let me explain you something. A few weeks ago, one of the members was inquiring about, you know, checking on Brother Mars, seeing how he's doing. And they discovered something and they shared it with me. The type of cancer that he's battling, and by the way, keep praying, keep praying. I, you know, we get more good indicators then we get bad indicators, and I thank God for that. I thank God for that. But one of the consequences of the type of cancer that he's currently battling, um, sitting is very difficult. It's very difficult. And uh, I thought about that. They said to me, you know, Pastor Brown, there's got to be some kind of chair, something that we can help them get so he can sit down and, and, and not feel like his world is blowing up. And I thought about what they said. I said, you know something? So I said, Brother Marsh, come with me. I wanted to find out if there was such a thing as a chair that he actually could comfortably sit in. 
And I had him sit, 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 and I discovered, I discovered there is such a thing as a chair that he can comfortably sit in and not have it blow his world up. And so, what's in this envelope is approximately half of what we need to get that chair. And I just thought to myself, I said, you know, I, I've only been here two years and I love Brother Marsh. I said, you all been hanging out with him longer than me. And uh, I said, maybe it could be that some of the saints would be willing to help us uh, get this chair for him. So what I'm going to do is this. After service, like I said, the, the, I have half of it already. I have half of it already. After service, if you're willing to help us secure this chair for him now, you know, I always try to be careful doing stuff like this because, you know, I, I don't want you to think I'm going to be up here every week calling for something. But the point is, you know, you don't, it's not every day you get a Brother Marsh. Amen. And uh, I got so tickled when um, it was time for, you know, communion a couple of weeks ago. And uh, my team was up to do, you know, visiting communion. And when, now my team is, it's, it's a handful of people, okay? But when people started finding out that I was going to give communion to Brother Marsh, <laughs> I look up, this was coming, this was coming, this was coming. We ended up needing several cars. I said, Lord, you good. I, 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 I praise the Lord. I just, I just had to laugh. So, so um, I, I know he means a lot to me. I know he means a lot to a lot of you. And so after service, if you're able to, to help us uh, with this project, we only need about, only need about maybe 400 more, maybe 500 more. But if you're willing to help out, just see me after church. Uh, what I want to be able to do is get this project out the way. And uh, we just praise the Lord. Uh, I'm getting ready to sit down. But I want to tell you something. I didn't get a chance to tell you last week because I wasn't here because I was sick. I had a chance to brag about my church last week. I, um, I was doing, uh, it was my turn to do worship for the office. You know, every week somebody else has a different assignment. And my, assi my week came up. And I don't remember how it came up, but I just uh, had a chance to let the saints then know that God, in his infinite goodness and mercy, put me in the garden spot of the world. And I had to let the saints know that it's not just a cliche. It's not just a saying. I had to let them know QBT is the place to be. And I said to myself, you know, I, I better be careful bragging about my church so much. I'm going to make somebody jealous. And they're going to try to get up here and see what's going on because I'm not planning to leave here anytime soon. Amen. So, but I love you, and I thank God for you. And according to his tender mercy, when we get to heaven, I don't know, I'm starting to think there's going to be a QBT corner. Let's worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, beloved. Sabbath, everyone. Let us all stand for a hymn of praise.
Amen, amen. The scripture reading taken from Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. I'll read in your hearing. He said, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. May the Lord bless his words. At this time, let us remain standing, please. Well, it's prayer time at the QBT. <clears throat> Today, just before we have our prayer, first I want to say that uh, you have something that you need from the Lord today. I'm not hearing myself. Are we on? Okay. Today, if you have a need that you want the Lord to do something for you, come. If you have some sick loved ones that you want God to deliver, come. Uh, many of you ladies have been praying every week for your children. You too, come. Whatever it is you're going through, when you need some extra help, come. There is a Heavenly Father, this Sabbath morning, we, here we are in your courts. Thank you that you promised to meet with your children. We come from the east and the west and the north and the south, but we are here this morning to give you praise for keeping us safe during the week in spite of the storm, in spite of the tornado. Not one is missing. We are all here. Thanks be to God for your goodness, for your grace, for your tender mercies towards the people of Queensboro. We thank you for blessing us and keeping us in such a way. We thank you that in spite of it all, you we learn to trust in you. This morning as we come, we not only give you thanks and praise for providing for us, for sustaining us, for protecting us. We thank you that you have looked over our families, our children, our husbands and our wives, our brothers and our sisters, those who are visiting with us. We thank you for allowing us to be able to minister. Thank you for providing for us. Thank you for making Queensboro Temple a place where people can come and get food, physical food from our food pantry program. Thank you for allowing us to be there with all these different prayer entities, doors that is open that we people can find help, not only on Sabbath, but during the week also. Thank you for the exercise uh, class that we have with Sister Sawyers that is helping to meet our, our, our needs to keep us in fit. Thank you for all these areas, these doors that is open, available to us. 
we know that you delight to in us having good health for you said that you wish that our soul prosper and be in good health even as we prosper so this morning this morning as we come we thank you for what you are doing right now in heavenly places this morning we do not appear before a court of law here on the earth, but we appear before the courts of heaven where Jesus, our sin bearer, our deliverer, uh, the one right now who is looking after our names, the, right, the one right now who is saying, Father, my blood. And this morning, each of us, his blood is applied to us, and we are claiming it this morning. We believe it, Lord. We believe you when you say it. And so we ask this morning to forgive us all from our sins as you go over the names. May all of our names, may you not pass out over, but may you, may you truly say, my blood, Father, was shed for him. Even Brother Williams, uh, even, uh, even Brother Henry, even, even this, the, the, every family here this morning, every individual here this morning, everyone that kneeled before you this morning in humble, in humble adoration to you this morning, we ask that you will draw us closer and still closer to you. We ask of thee for, for us to have a deeper relationship with you. Sometimes under the burdens, we tend to question you. We tend to wonder, are you there, Lord? But today, we know that you are there. You promised to be here with, with us, even unto the very end of the world. So we, are, we, so we thank you for your great promises. We pray for Troy this morning. We pray for Brother Marsh this morning. We pray for Brother Clark this morning. And we pray for every other person who's not mentioning the names, who is sick among us, who need your healing, who need you to minister to them this morning. We ask that you will touch their lives this morning. Even if the woman touch your garment, even so, Lord, they believe in you for a touch this morning. Heal them and grant good health so that they can rejoice again, knowing that God is the one who grant them good health. And all of us will not fail to join them and give you the praise and the honor and the glory. For without health, we can do nothing. So this morning, bless them. Bless the children and the family. Bless the Marsh family in a special way, Lord. For it is tough. It is tough when he had to undergo and bear these burdens. He do not bear, him by, bear them by himself. His family bear them also. So bless the children. Bless his wife. Oh God, be with them. Strengthen them. Open doors, avenues. The things that we know not of, but you have a thousand ways to bless your children this morning. So this morning we also pray for all who have come to the altar this morning. The names that is in the prayer box this morning. You know who they are. You know the burdens that the people bearing. Uh, the, the mothers who have been praying and Sabbath after Sabbath forming a circle beseeching you on behalf of the children. Oh Lord, you have to answer this prayer. We come, Lord. You give them to us. And sometimes we might fail you. Sometimes the, the Lord is too much to carry. But at the cross where Jesus shed his precious blood, where he put it down, that we through him might be able to live. So this morning as we come and we present them, we present our sons and our daughters, the children that is in our care, we present them to you and we ask of you to minister to them. Reach them when we, where we fail, Lord. Touch their lives today, even in this place, cause that every child, will come to be aware that Jesus saves. Come bring them, Lord, even those who are not here. Touch them. Speak to, the, to them this morning. Arrest them wherever they are, that they should acknowledge the God that they once knew and that they might return. Draw them back to you. As you do so, let none stand in the way to discourage them. For it's only you alone knows 
Then we pray for all those who come up this morning. Families, they come, Lord. They come to you. Minister to their needs this morning. You know what they are. Some is health. Some is stress. Some is the marriage. Some is the children. Some is a living experience with you. A closer walk. Some, Lord, give them this experience with you today that they will have a new testimony to share what great things the Lord has done for them in their lives. So I commit their needs and I commit them, every one of them, into your hands this morning. Do only as you alone can. Then bless the larger congregation this morning as we all wait upon you this morning. Touch the lives. Work out things in such a way, Lord, that nobody will keep quiet after this day. Create that fire that was shut up in the bones of Jeremiah. Let it happen to each one of us today that all of us will have a story to tell. Nobody will keep quiet after this day. No man will shut us up. Oh God, I pray that you will minister today in such a way. May your Holy Spirit rain upon us. Rain upon us, Lord. Let Queensboro not only be the, come the place to be, but the place where Jesus performed miracles. The place where the harvest will be done. In this case, we pray for the evangelistic efforts that will be coming up in the month of May. And this summer, we ask that you will so inspire your people. Inspire us in such a way. Give us the Holy Spirit, a double unction of the Spirit this morning. Even right now, cause your rain to fall upon us. Fill us, I pray, that we will never be the same. That we will have to ask for an opportunity to give our testimony. Do this thing for us, we pray. Then bless our pastor. Bless his family. Keep him healthy. Keep them healthy and strong. Preserve them unto yourself. And as Peter and, and, and the rest of the disciples ask you, so minister to him so that he could minister to us. You ask them if, if they love you, Lord. And you say to, when they give their answer, you say to feed my sheep. So bless Pastor Brown. Continue to use him to feed the lambs and the sheep here at QBT. And strengthen us and prepare us for your soon and glorious return. Bless the speaker who would minister to us this morning. Bless the entire health department. Bless your church this morning. And wherever Seventh-day Adventists meet around this land and across the globe, touch their lives and do something for your people, for truly the days are evil. Hear my prayer this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Many tears and sorrows I've got question for tomorrow There have been times I didn't know right from wrong 
But in every situation, God gave blessed consolation that my trials only come to make me strong. I've been to lots of places and I've seen so many faces. There have been times I felt so all alone. But in those lonely hours, those precious lonely hours, Jesus let me know I was his own. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus and I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word. So I thank God for the mountains, and I thank Him for the valley. Storms He brought me through. problem I wouldn't know that God could solve them wouldn't know what faith in his word could do through it all yes through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus and I've learned to trust in God It's time, it is time for us to return our tithes and offering. And reading from the book of Leviticus, Leviticus um, 30 to be exact, the word of God said, And all the tithes of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, it is the Lord, it is holy unto the Lord. And if a man will at odd redeem out of his tithes, he shall add there to the fifth part thereof. And concerning the tithes of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passes under the rod, the tent shall be holy unto the Lord. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. The deacon and the deaconess will go forward to receive the Lord's tithes and offering at this time.
rob God, yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offering? Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that they may be meat in my house, and prove me now wherewith, said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, dear God, we thank you for this great privilege to return your tithes and offering. And as we present it before you, dear God, we pray that you will bless it, that it will go forth and do your work. We pray also, dear God, for what, from what we have given from, that we will not run short of doing what we need to do according to your will. So, dear God, we thank you and we praise you for your wonderful name. We thank you, dear God, to provide a job for us, the Heavenly Father. But most of all, dear God, you give your life on the cross of Calvary, that we can be with you in your kingdom when you come. Keep us faithful, I pray, in the mighty and the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. No, no, I need more energy. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It is now praise and worship time, and I'm inviting you guys to sing with us as we let the glory of God rise among us.
next song just says, Great Are You, Lord. So we invite you to actually sing with us this time. Amen. It's praise and worship time, and God has been so good. There was an earthquake yesterday, and we're all here today. We haven't broken an arm. We haven't broken a leg. So please, I invite you to sing with us. Amen.
Praise team, you did a good job. I, I probably could have stood one more song, but I, it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, you know, I looked out and uh, I, I saw a visitor uh, from the only church that could rival uh, the love I have for this place. But the Logan is visiting from Lebanon. Good to see you, my friend. How you doing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He um, comes from a remarkable family, but I don't have time to tell you that whole story now, but it's good to have him. And uh, feel free to come back anytime. Time to introduce the speaker, but I want to introduce the introducer. Because... Years from now, you will look back and realize what a truly remarkable time we had here at Queensboro. Let me explain what I mean. Let me explain what I mean. I look at the different folks who are in leadership here, and it is stunning to me that we have so many passionate, committed, creative, resourceful people all in one place. Just, you, just, 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 just pick, just, just pick, and, and, and it'll blow your mind. We, we, have, we, we have one of the best Bible workers in the conference. In fact, she's going to be honored at camp meeting for her work in evangelism. Talk about Sister Clark. If you were at our international social, you know our social coordinator is no shabby slouch. If you think about what happens here with, with family life, if you think about our, our deacons and our deaconess, I am just blown away at the wonderful group of people that provide leadership here at this church. And when it comes to health ministry, there is no drop-off. In fact, in fact, in fact, I don't think some of you understand what our health ministry leader does in an effort to be faithful. So here's the deal. She's got a real J-O-B. And on her J-O-B, she deals with a lot of knuckleheads. And sometimes it gets so intense that her day just gets swallowed up dealing with unnecessary drama. And a couple of times the Lord put her on my mind. I call her, she called me, just have prayer with her to remind her that God's got this. And with all of that, with not a full plate, I mean, she don't even have a full platter. She got a full buffet. But with all of that, she continues to provide tremendous leadership in the area of health ministry, to the point, to the point, to the point that every time I turn around, somebody from the conference or different ones, 
call, oh, uh, can Lisa help with this? Oh, can she, can she help with that? And uh, it makes me feel good because I know that here at Queensboro, in the area of health ministry, we will never come up short while she's in leadership. And so, um, just because I want to make sure you appreciate what we have, I wanted to introduce the person who needs no introduction. And that is our own Lisa Livingston, Health Ministries Director, loving wife of John Livingston. You know, we were walking up the hall and John's tie was a little crooked and, and honey was fixing him up, fixing him up. I said, I love it, I love it, I love it. So Lisa, come on up and introduce the speaker and thank you for all you do. Thank you for all you bring. We love you, we love you, we love you. Come on up. You know, I have uh, been a member of, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. I have been a member of Queensboro Church for maybe 25 years. And I tell you, Queensboro will always be my home. Always be my home. There are some wonderful people that I have known throughout the years who have just been so loving, so encouraging. And it just brings joy when people who truly love the Lord, we can come together, not only worship, but just have fellowship. It's a beautiful place to be. However, this morning, as you know, is Health Emphasis Day. And I want to tell you that health is truly the right hand it is truly something that our Lord wants us to understand, to implement in our lives, because he wants us to be the very best that we can be in service. And so I am so privileged this morning to have a really good friend of mine that I truly respect. I will go on the battlefield any day with Brother Leslie Williams. He loves the Lord. And... I'm inspired by his dedication and how he serves. He's patient. He's always willing to take an angle which is different. But I can tell you that he is always committed to give his all onto the service of the Lord. And it is an inspiration that God gives us people that he can demonstrate that his spirit can truly work through and be a blessing to others and to the community. So I want to introduce to you my friend, uh, Elder Leslie D. Williams. He is now the Northeastern Conference newly appointed Health Ministries Coordinator. He will be serving underneath Dr. Joshua Dionarine, who is our health ministry director, which services the North, the Northern New England, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island areas. It is his primary focus and goal through his service of his term for these years to accomplish four goals. And goal number one is this, to increase total member involvement to educate, equip, empower, and encourage church members, especially our youth and our young adults, to serve as a health advocate and to educate others in the community. Thirdly, to engage and educate community stakeholders who support us with capacity of buildings and resources, expertise, meeting spaces, and funding, to help us do even more to improve community health. But finally, and not lastly, but finally, make Seventh-day Adventists a relevant, empowering force in the day-to-day -day lives of the people we live, work, and worship with throughout Queens and beyond. So after the hymn of meditation, I want to introduce to you our dear brother, Elder Leslie Williams.
spirit. I cried, Lord, lift me up. I want to go higher with thee. But the Lord knows I can't live on the mountain. So he picked out a valley for me. And the sun seldom shines, and I question, Lord, why must this be? Then he tells me there's strength in my sorrows, and there's victory. Somewhere in the valley below, he draws me aside to be tested and tried. But in the valley, he restoreth my soul. and tried but in the valley in the valley in the valley he restoreth my soul Amen Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I am pleased to be here today. They told me I would never make it to, to Queensboro. Hold on one second. My phone. They said I would never get here. They told me a lot of other things also about myself that all proved to be untrue because I have a Jesus in heaven that vindicates me. We are here today by only the grace and mercy of God. And we would like to, meaning all of us collectively, to be in harmony with him, his will, his way, and his word. And I get one witness here at Queensboro. Okay, very good. I got three, five, six. Okay, good. I never thought I would be here. In 2010, I was going to leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I was out. I was done. Finished. Forks in me. Because I didn't know what we were doing. I was coming to church. We were singing songs. We were getting preached at. Uh, we would have some food downstairs every now and then. Then eat, we'd go home. And then we'd come back a week later and do the same thing. While young folks were getting murdered in front of our church, while all kinds of mayhem and madness was taking place 
And when we would say we need to do something, oh, we're not ready for that yet. We don't have the money for that yet. We don't have the expertise for that yet. But I know, and I pray that you know, that we serve an all-sufficient God. And this God sent his only begotten son so that if we actually believe in him, if we actually obey him, that we could do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Can I get yet another witness? Because, see, I travel all through North America with one message. We ain't doing enough. We have been given a birthright and we scorn it like Esau. We have sold out. We have not done the things that God has told us that we would need to do in these last days. I know that on January 2nd, there was an earthquake right around the corner from here. It was a 1.7. I heard on the yesterday, on my sister's born day, that there was one that was 4.7. Hmm, that's a big jump, right? Now, let me ask you, are you ready for the next one? It's because I heard Jesus tell his disciples that in the last days, that there will be what? In diverse places. I ain't never heard of an earthquake in New York City. Unlike uh, uh, California, their buildings are earthquake proof, some of them. I can't wait to see that Empire State Building when we get that 7.8. Because it's coming down along with everything around it. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Mm, okay, we're going to see at the end of this uh, sermon. I won't even call it that because I'm not a preacher. I'm more of a teacher. And I hope that, again, that you will not look at me but listen to the words that are coming out of my mouth because I'm hoping that they're Jesus' words, not my own. Let us pray. <laughs> Father in heaven again, I am so grateful to be your son. I'm so grateful to be in this position. Growing up, they told me I would never be anything. They said I'd be dead before I was 25. They said that I would not be able to do anything in this world or in this society that would account for much. But praise the Lord, there is a God in heaven that intercedes for me and all your people here today that says that is a lie from the pit of hell and that I have something exceeding abundantly above all that all of my people can think of so, Lord, I ask you today to speak to the hearts and minds that are of those that have gathered, that they will hear your voice, that they will hear your entreaty, your appeal, that, Lord, that they will do according to your will. They will take action. Adventism is a verb. We are about action. And in Jesus' name, we just want to be in the middle of that action. Amen. Now, I want to thank Lisa. Me and Lisa, we've been going back and forth. She's supposed to go out to Utah one time, and, you know, things didn't work out. And we keep in touch uh, because there are very few people that want to do the work, okay? And I'm going to define the work in a little bit because we think the work is getting up early on the seventh day to come here and to make sure that all your dishes are washed before the sun go down the day before. That ain't the work. The work is outside of these, well, you got more than four walls here, but whatever, the, <laughs> whatever number of walls y'all got, it's outside of here. And I'm going to be honest with you. The reason I was going to leave Adventism is I, I didn't see purpose in it because I saw all the murder, the rape, the pillage, any city that I go to, and I couldn't understand. Like every time that somebody kills themselves, I was like, what would have happened if an Adventist would have got to them? Maybe if somebody would have got to them before they got to the point of hopelessness. Because, again, in my whole life, an Adventist has never knocked on my door except my kids and my wife, okay? And the bottom line is, I never understood why that was. Um, I was raised up here in New York City. I'm from Harlem, USA. And um, uh, again, did I tell you they wanted to put me in special ed in third grade over at PS123? Uh, did, did you know that we have a school to prison pipeline right here in uh, the great city of New York? Did you know that? Did you know that we got 90,000 prisoners in uh, uh, Ninety percent of them come from six neighborhoods looking like y'all. Did you know that? What are we doing about it? I'm going to tell you what we're going to do about it because it's a plan. It's called a blueprint. I ain't know nothing about no blueprint until I was almost 50 years old. 
Can you imagine that? But I've been in the church since 1968. You believe that? Oh, and my family got into this in 1900. So we've been in this for 124 years, and I've only known about the work for 13 years. How's that? Are you confused? I was real confused, and so I quit my job. That's how confused I was. I said, Lord, I'm going to leave this thing called Seventh-day Adventism unless you tell me why you created me to be a Seventh-day Adventist, because it ain't making no sense to me. I don't know what my purpose is. I had money, I had this, and I was still not happy. That's a word that I could use. I was not pleased with my status, not meaning like I wanted to go higher, but no matter what I achieved, I was still empty. And that was when I left the church at 18, and when I came back at 30, I was still not fulfilled. So I came back into the church after the Rodney King verdict, and I came back to New York. Because I couldn't understand how that could be happening, and they caught those brothers on video. And um, I lost a lot of money that year, too, and I was real mad at those people. And see, I, did I mention I didn't know Jesus? Did I mention that, right? And I was going to go murder them, okay? Because that was a lot of money. You, you think uh, 100 million is a lot of money? 100 billion? How about 300? It's more than that. Lost it. Because somebody decided they want to get greedy. They want to take the whole enchilada and leave us with just a couple. And I, did I mention I'm from Harlem, right? Okay, so where I come from, if somebody robbed you, <laughs> they're not, okay, they're not gonna rob me face to face because I'm gonna fight for my wallet, all right? But say they, they go to your house and they rob you, take your flat screen, you looking all over that neighborhood. You see anybody come out of here with a box look like a big screen? <laughs> Which way they go? And you gonna hunt them down and you gonna get you gonna get you gonna get your TV back. Okay? And so again, because of my warped mind, because of my uh, Northeastern University education because I was so embedded in society and I still had that that hood in me, okay? I said, I can't help myself. I've got to hurt these people. And uh, th this is 92. I'm going back and forth between two stories, so you're going to have to keep up with me, okay? All right? And so um, the whole thing boiled down to um, I can't even understand how they're going to live to see tomorrow. I called all of them up. And I told them, next time you see me, it's going to be church. Okay? I'm going to be the last person, the last voice. And don't let your mama be with you because she's going too. Okay? <laughs> no witnesses. So where I come from, there ain't no witnesses. <laughs> okay? And so the Lord, I lost, I'm going to tell you, I actually lost my mind. Um, I, I packed up my stuff in my car because I said, I ain't going to buy no pistol down here in Atlanta. I don't know nobody down here. And. I'm going to get caught up in a sting or something. I'm going to go back to the block. I know, I know Snooky's still out there. <laughs> he's still doing his thing. I made that phone call. And he's still out there. He got everything I need. Uh, you got them hollow points. I got it all. You come with it, okay? But I need my money. So I just, I was just in New York six months before that. I was like, man, I'm going to get this layer jet. We're about to do the business. I'm going to head out to LAX, and I'm going to call Haley Barry Publishing. You don't think she's going to come and get on my plane? Now, later on in my development, I heard the Lord's voice say, man, you're so stupid. <laughs> I gave you all that ability. You could have got that money, but look how you want to use my money on some Halle Berry. You know, she got problems. Well, I didn't know that at the time, but I know now. The bottom line is, is that because of my worldly education, I had no place for Jesus. I wasn't praying. I wasn't doing none of that because... I was smart. They told me I was smart. And I was going, they said, man, you can make a lot of money. Where? Where, where that money? Yeah. Show me where to, show me the money. My brother said he good money, new money. Okay. And this is how we were raised in the Adventist church. I grew up at the White Plains Seventh-day Adventist church right down the street. Okay. And my parents, everybody, we all immigrants, and we were told, make that money. Okay. You got you to gotta go back home. One day, but we need to go back with some of these U.S. dollars. And so, again, my whole trajectory was wrong, even growing up in the church. Now, I know that I left at 18 and barely made it back at almost 30. Barely. Okay? The only thing that saved me, though, was Jesus. 
And I'm going to share with you how Jesus even used a dysfunctional church to save a brother. Okay? So, again, I told you it's 92. I come back to New York, and I'm like, but I'm too embarrassed to go ask anybody for the money that I need to go give Snooky, Right? Because I'm prideful because I grew up here in America. And I can't tell these people I'm broke. I need $1,000 to pay Snooky so I could do this thing. Then I said, I'm going to go back to my old church. But I went back to my old church. And them brothers said, mm -mm. you know what, Jesus, what's coming if you back in church? <laughs> Can't believe it, boy, we didn't think you was dead. You was the worst picnic we ever have in this church. <laughs> Always running around and causing havoc. I said, do you know I am homicidal right now? <laughs> Then you didn't get that memo, and I tried to ignore it because I went there looking for Jesus to save me from me. Okay, I went there looking for him. So I didn't feel too good. I didn't see Jesus that day. Okay, so I said, I'm going to come back the second week. Lord of mercy, two weeks in a row. Oh, I got to get my life right. Because if you in church two weeks in a row, I know this is a sign of the coming I don't know what made me go back the third week, but I did go back the third week, and it was worse. And I made up in my mind that day, I ain't never stepping foot back in a Seventh-day Adventist church. Okay? I said, them people, them wicked, they raised me from five years old, and them wicked. But as I was about to leave, here comes Randy White. Randy White comes and gives me a book in my hand. He's like, it was good to see you. I ain't seen it. Now, I ain't seen none of these people in 12 years. They ain't never going back to the church unless I was picking up a sister after sundown. No comment. No comment. And he said, take this book. I said, what is this, man? I got to get out of here. I ain't never coming back. These people, they messed up, man. They, they didn't even ask me how I'm doing. They didn't ask me where, I, where I've been. They didn't ask me what's going on with me. Don't they see that I got a glazed over look every time I come here because I'm he says, man, I don't know what you're going through. I probably can't help you, but you need to take this book. Now listen, who's Ellen White? I ain't never heard of no Ellen White. I raised up from five years old. I ain't never heard of her. Okay? Uh, great controversy. What's that about? Leslie, just take the book, read it, and be blessed. All right, I'll take it, but you ain't seen me here. And I prophesy because she died shortly thereafter, early onset Alzheimer's at 57. So I never got a chance to thank him for giving me that book. And so I started, now this is in 92, I started reading this book. And I said, man, didn't that same teacher I hit in the head with a brick and, and never went back to school after, after third grade? How could she write something like this? Because, you know, I went to school. And I was a history this and that. I'm like, there's no way she could know this in 1863, man. That's impossible. They just found the Hittites in 1980. But she writing about the Hittites, and everybody, the whole world was saying that they didn't exist, that they was just fictitious. How she know that? So I said, you know what? I'm going to read this whole book. And so, but you know what? If with all my learning, I had to get a dictionary, a thesaurus, a Bible dictionary, an encyclopedic, I couldn't understand it. Why? Because my mind was so worldly, but I did know that she was special. I didn't know what a prophet was. I didn't even know we had prophets in Adventism. I didn't know that. I was 30. Grew up in this. Didn't know. I was, supposed to, I was supposed to present a different message today, but as I drove down here from Massachusetts, the Lord is like, Leslie, if you didn't know, and you did all, those, all that studying, these people here, my people, they probably don't know either. And so I need you to go down there and give them the ABCs of who we are, why we exist, and why we are dying in North America, okay? I want, I'm going to give you some statistics right now, okay? Then I'm, then I'm going to get into my message, okay? I have to give you a little backdrop because I shouldn't be here. The world told me that I, I didn't even tell you about 1983 when I was looking at 33 Class A felonies, looking at 165 years in a New Jersey State Penitentiary. Ooh, oh, oh, yeah, that's me. See, because at the end of the day, what you see ain't always what you get. 
People like to call me pastor. Yes, I am a pastor, not an ordained pastor, but we're all pastors because we all have a flock. You have a flock, not just your kids and your family. It's everyone that you come in contact with. They're supposed to see Jesus reflected in you, in your speech, in the way that you do kind things for them without anybody having to ask you to do that kind thing. But we're going to get to that in a minute. He's delivered me from me. So as I'm reading this book, I get to chapter 8, and it's uh, the Swiss reformers. And it said that the way that the, that, the, that the gospel was spread during 500 years ago was not through preaching, no offense. It was through teaching. Because the ministers were on lockdown. Because the Pope was like, where that Luther at? Y'all get him, kill him on sight. Don't even bring him here. I don't want to see him. So Melanchthon and all these other reformers were hiding. Teachers taught the students. The students taught their parents. The parents said questions back. So I'm reading this in the spirit of prophecy, chapter 8, right around my birthday, 1992. And again, I still am trying to figure out how I'm going to get this thousand dollars to take care of Snooky, right? And I said, I don't want to do this thing. My mother came, we from Belize. She came up here the rough way, okay? And she spent 20 years as an illegal in this country until she got amnesty under some Ronald Reagan, believe it or not, in 86. And we lived that immigrant life. I don't know if you lived that immigrant life when you ain't got papers, Everybody, shh. <laughs> I don't know if you know anything about that. We have rules. Don't let nobody know what's going on in your house. Don't let nobody know where you live. Walk the long way. If they ask you anything about who you are, where your mama is, because she don't ever come to the school, tell her that she's just working. If they come to the house, nobody ever answer that door. Okay? Because, again, um, we weren't supposed to be here. So I have an affinity for my people that's trying to get here. And everybody got here in some way. Everybody ain't Native American. Everybody ain't Native American. And so on that day, I read John, I'm sorry, um, John 17. And it's for the first time. I said, wait. So Jesus knew I was going to be this big troublemaker. He knew I was going to be robbing and stealing and slanging and doing all of that with a college degree, no less, because I ain't going to work for the man. If, jo if Joseph Kennedy can do it selling some bootleg liquor from Canada, I don't need to do and get whipped by the system. Again, you see how warped my thinking was? All that learning, all those Sabbath schools, because we went to Sabbath school 52 weeks a year because my aunt was a Sabbath school teacher. We don't miss that. But again, what God has for you as it relates to your future don't sell him short. Don't accept this world's uh, standard for what is excellence because it's garbage. Oh, but Leslie, we're going to give you this. We're going to give you a raise. We're gonna get... Yeah, but how can I minister to people about what's getting ready to come on this world? This is our job as Adventists. How are we supposed to do that when we ain't doing it? I'm sorry. We don't even know that we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to do, because we have not read. So I got on my knees that night, and I told Jesus, I said, listen, you know I don't pay attention to you. I do whatever I want to do when I want to do it. And I ain't scared of no devil because he can't make me do nothing. He can't make me sin, and you can't make me do right. But I got a problem. The problem is me, and I'm going to kill these people because you know me. Once I make up my mind, I'm going to do it. But I don't want to do it. Look at what my mother had to go through. 6 o'clock in the morning down on the Upper West Side cleaning toilets and doing all kinds of menial manual labor. Now she's going to have to see them execute me in Georgia in about 15 years because they're going to catch me because I already told everybody I'm coming to get them. Okay? I already told them that was the stupid part. I should just left town and came back. I'm like, I don't know. Everybody from that crew just getting wasted. We don't know what's going on. But I, would, like, I told you I lost my mind. I left everything in my apartment. If it couldn't fit in my car, I lost my mind. And all I could see every day was me doing this act. But on that day, I told Jesus, this first, because I saw him for who he was for the first time in my life. See, because anybody that would come for a brother like me, okay, no father, poverty, all, you know, you know the story, you know. 
Uh, no supervision because she got to work 12 hours a day. Okay, she's so tired when she get back, she can't do nothing but go to sleep. Okay, the bottom line, <coughs> excuse me, the bottom line is that all of you, all of us are going to have a come home to Jesus meeting sooner or later. You could avoid it, you could resist it, but you're going to get it. If you resist it, you lost. But you're going to have to be honest with him sooner or later, and you're going to have to come to terms with whether or not you're going to do what he say do or not. And so I sat there, and I ain't never did this before in my life. I got on my knees in that little hovel that my mother was living in in the Bronx, and I said to Jesus, listen, I'm going to do this thing, but I need you to save me from me. Okay? I need you to save me from me because I'm sick. I can't help it. They mess with my mama's house money. How could they do that and think they're not going to have to pay something? And I said, I don't care if you have to blind me, maim me, or cripple me, but save me from me. And before I even finished the thought, I wasn't praying out loud because I didn't even know how to pray at that time. I was just thinking this. And before the last thought even emanated from my thought, I was at peace. I was having dreams. I was having nightmares. And I said, you got a deal. I'm going to serve you till the day that I die. I don't care what I got to give up. I don't care. So here comes my true education. Okay? I didn't know anything. Like I said, I've been in the church since 68. That's 92. And so I started to read and I started to study. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman. Rightly dividing the word of truth. A workman. You are here to work. I'm here to tell you, I'll tell you, share with you what this work is. Many of you are not going to do it because you are very comfortable just where you are coming here once a week. You're fine with that. You don't have a problem with it. Okay? And people are going to ask and say, why we got to do all that? I've been in the church all my life. I heard this in Orange, New Jersey, at the Orange Seventh-day Adventist Church. I've been an Adventist my whole life. And Jesus eat fish. We went dead with me fish in my mouth. I said, brother, you just pronounced a curse on your own life. I said, I said, do you know that in the spirit of prophecy, we're going to talk about that in a second, that she says that the, that the animals will be so diseased in the last days that they will not be fit for human consumption. Okay? Disease, growth hormone, steroids, um, uh, antibiotic, genetic modification. That's not what God created. If you're still doing that, you're killing yourself. I, no judgment. Judge ye not. I'm not here to judge. You could do whatever you want to. I won't be at your funeral. Okay. The bottom line is, is that we, as God's people, we've sinned. And I'm, but I'm going to give you a way out. Okay? Look at what it says here. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. He's given us yet another chance to come and reason with him. He says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. That's a promise. But it's based on a condition. It goes on, though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as snow. Now the word reason there means what? A power of the mind to think, understand, form judgments by a process of logic. So when I told that man what he was eating, even though he said it was from out in the ocean, do you know that the Japanese are, are dumping the water from Fukushima into the ocean? Did you know that? Did you know that the ocean is like a big washing machine and it's eventually going to get uh, uh, to New York? It's going, to get, it's going to be all over. You can't eat that stuff anymore. But I'm not here to talk about food because Adventists hate me coming anywhere. and I don't do any food or diet help. See, because we have a message to bear to the world which we're not giving. There are two gospels. I'm sorry, there's one gospel, but there's two parts to it. The gospel of health and the gospel of salvation. The gospel of health divided or separated from the gospel of salvation is not the gospel. Now, nobody else believes this, but we are what? We are a peculiar people, being set aside for a special purpose. So we don't do what everybody else does. We don't live our lives because another thing that we've done is that we've just made health just about food. There's dress reform. Did you know there's work reform? That there are things that we're not supposed to be doing with ourselves. The work, like for example, nurses. I'm, I'm mad at y'all. When somebody said, some bean counter said, y'all gonna work 12 hours a day like runaway slaves. I'm sorry, 12 hours a day for three days, and then you're going to get four days off. Oh, I get four days off. You're sleeping for four days. You ain't doing nothing. 
because your circadian rhythm is wrong, your mind is wrong, you stressed out. You st because again, you off, but you got to do all the stuff that, that, that regular people do. The bottom line is, you got stuck. In. Because somebody only want two shifts and not three shifts, it's a business. Okay? The bottom line is, is that we are in a system that we need to unplug from. It's a matrix. You know, you know the, in, 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 uh, the word matrix in the Greek means womb. This where we are, earth is a womb. And God wants us to produce fruit. The fruit of the womb. That's your baby. That's your sons and your daughters. You are the sons and daughters of God. But we have not been gestating the way that we need to gestate. We've been deficient. And again, it's not your fault. I don't know why they came to Belize and told us that health reform was just um, uh, clean and unclean, fermented and unfermented, and don't take drugs. That is not health reform. That is not health. That's not even close to health reform. I'm going to give you a, and I'm way off script, but I'm going to say it's, it's coming to me. It's taken from the book Evangelism. I'm sorry. Do you folks believe in the testimony of Jesus Christ? You believe in the spirit of prophecy? Because I went to some places out in California, and you know what they told me? They said, you quote Ellen White too much. These are pastors. You quote Ellen White too much, and that's not our culture out here. I said, what, brother? It ain't your culture. Tell me what your culture is. Oh, man, we like to surf, man, and we go to the beach for Vespers. And I was like, y'all take brothers to the beach for Vespers? I was like, if you took me to a beach, you would not see me at 18 years old. If I'm, I was like, it's a separate beach, right? No, it's whatever. I'm like, y'all wasting people's time. But you know what? Everybody has free will to do what they want to do. I don't judge nobody, but listen to this. The spirit of prophecy is being scorned. It is also our birthright. We're treating it like Esau, like we don't have to, and you don't. But the spirit of prophecy does not contradict the Bible. It does not supersede the Bible. It reinforces the Bible and what God expects us to do in these last days so that we can end the great controversy and be with our Lord forever and ever and ever. Do you know that in 1903, Sister White preaches a sermon called Lessons from the Unfaithful Spies, and she's talking about the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. She had said back then, from 1873, that we need to work the large cities of North America. And so A.G. Daniels, G.I. Butler, W.W. W. Prescott, and all these brothers, see, I, I had to go back and find out why we exist. I didn't understand why I was a Seventh-day Adventist after all these years. And by studying our history, I was able to figure out why we are messed up right now. And when I say messed up, because some, somebody's always going to say, oh, he came here, and he bashed the church, and he talked bad, and he don't know what it is that we do. And Thank you, sir. I was about to fall out. <laughs> I'm sorry. One sorry about that. <clears throat> and so the, the whole premise of my coming here, the reason that I'm working with Pastor Tiana Ryan right now is that we, I've been doing this for 14 years. Okay. And guess what? I've been unsuccessful for 14 years. Because no church across the United States has ever done the things that I present from the Bible, from the spirit of prophecy, from Christ's ministry and church history. They won't do it. My old church, I will not name that church. Okay. So we, we're using a plan. You need to come back and hear the plan because there's 2.336 million people in Queens alone. And they're running a little scared right now. This is the, see, God is working on our behalf because now people are like, what's this going on? I've never seen no earthquake. Up. they nervous. And we already know what this is. We can't keep this to ourselves. But I'm going to read a couple things before I shut it down so that you can see that God has already prepared us. Remember, remember the pandemic? Anybody remember that thing? That old thing? Okay. Remember that one of the, one of the essential um, uh, areas was what? Food. You were selling food, man, they're going to they gonna let you stay open. Everybody else got to shut down. Airlines, everybody. But you, you sell some biscuits, oh, you can stay open. The bottom line is God knew that. God knows that food, health food specifically, is what it is that we need to be presenting to people because guess what? Any nurses here? Anybody in the health field here? Raise your hand. Let me just see. Let me scope this place out real quick. Mm -hmm. don't, don't go like this. Don't put your head down. Because I'm a, wait, put it up again. I missed it because that's just distracted me real quick. Okay, look, look at that. Person. All the way down there like that. Okay, very good. <laughs> in chapter 8, <clears throat> in chapter 8 in Councils on Health, 
nurses and helpers. Nurses and helpers. You know how important the work is that you do when you learn to do it because you ain't doing it. You know that you're supposed to be going with other people that have been trained as canvases, cold porters, and go door to door, and people are going to say, man, I got this pain. You're going to be there to legitimize us and our medical missionaries because you got that license that the state of New York say that you know what you're talking about. See, there's a formula. That's the blueprint. See, there's a method. Christ's method alone will give true success for reaching the people. Our Savior mingled. We don't mingle enough. The Bible says, go ye therefore, but we always tell people to come here. We're supposed to ask them to come here. But, but some people are never going to come here because they church hurt. They're never going to come here because they're Satanists and they worship in the devil. They're not going to come here. Maybe if you were giving them a million dollars, maybe some of them might, might show up, but we ain't got that for them. I'm going to read a couple things from the spirit of prophecy, since we say that we are on the same page with the spirit of prophecy. Okay? These are commandments. They're not optional. If God says, this is what I want you to do through the Holy Spirit, through his servant, he says, I don't do anything without telling my servants the prophets. And so, again, I can't believe the number of people that have rejected the spirit of prophecy, but that's also fulfillment of prophecy. That in the last days that people will say that what is true is error and what is error is truth. And if you don't know for yourself, you will be taken by this deception and this delusion, which is being poured out upon us even right now. My people, we are destroyed for lack of knowledge, but not because we rejected it. Well, some have. But the truth that I'm here to share with you in the afternoon, it's for all of us. Nobody told us, though. So God has winked at your ignorance. But once you hear this, you are going to be accountable to go teach and make disciples. Again, evangelism, page 514, paragraph 3. My guide has shown me. Now, evangelism is the book that we consider the Bible of how we're supposed to end the great controversy on this planet using health, evangelism, and using the preaching of the gospel. It says, my guide has shown me that those who believe the truth should practice health reform and diligently teach it to others, for it will be an agency or a means for presenting other truths. What are the truths of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Who can tell me? I've only had two people in 14 years to be able to tell me what we believe. We know they always say one thing, the Sabbath separates us from everybody. That's a lie. There's 66 other denominations that keep the Sabbath just here in the U.S. So what is it? This is a pop quiz. I usually pick on a kid because the adults get uh, embarrassed, but I know them little boys over there, they look about six or seven, they ain't going to know. Okay? Anybody, anybody has it to guess? Sanctuary. One. State of the dead. Spirit of prophecy. It's the spirit of prophecy. What is it? That would be under the spirit of prophecy. It's so, that would be spirit of prophecy. Did, did someone say the second coming? Did someone say the second coming? Okay. Those are the five. The sanctuary, the spirit of prophecy, the Sabbath, um, the state of the dead, and the second coming. The five S's of Seventh-day Adventism. This is what separates us from every other denomination on the planet. Now, there are even some, some, some brothers and sisters that believe in prophets. Uh, that would be like the uh, Pentecostal. They believe in prophets. The Mormons believe, okay? But all five of these make us unique on this planet. If you didn't know that or you couldn't just conjure that up, we need to study. We need to do this thing like you need to be in school. Do you know that every church is supposed to be set up like a training school so that you can learn how to do the work that Jesus did? Matthew 9.35 says that Jesus went teaching, preaching, and healing all manner of diseases. Chapter 9 in the Spirit of Prophecy, I'm sorry, in Ministry of Healing says teaching and healing. That's what the members are supposed to do. And we're supposed to be working with nurses and doctors uh, here along with medical missionaries. Testimony 7, page 62, paragraph 1. We're coming to a time when every member of the church should take hold of the medical missionary work. Thank you. I thought everybody nodded out on me. Every member. But let me define to you what medical missionary work is because there's a big misconception about what it is. People say, well, if you're a nurse and a doctor and you pray over your people and you point them to Jesus, yes, that's a medical missionary. You go to UT Pine. You go to um, um, uh, Weimar. 
and you learn herbology, you learn hydrotherapy, and you spend six months or a year, nine months there to learn these things so you could go back into the community. Yes, that's a medical missionary. But you know what? The, the purpose of health reform is to relieve the suffering of humanity. It's not about whether you're going to head to the colonel uh, after sundown. You could do what you want to do. But just know this, that if your habits cut your life expectancy short, you've robbed God of time, of service, of effort, and he will be, you will be judged for that. Okay? If you cut your life expectancy short because of whatever, you've robbed God. You've sinned against God. Because guess what? If you're sick, can you do the things that I'm going to tell you that we need to do? Are you going to be able to go door to door and, and, and teach people how to cook? Okay? What? We're supposed to be going? Listen. What you don't know can hurt you. Okay? What you don't know can hurt you. I'm here as a messenger of the Almighty, along with your pastor, Lisa, the conference, to say that there's a plan that we're implementing in Boston and in Phoenix and in Pasadena and in Toronto that we need to do here in the largest city on this, in this hemisphere. I'm sorry, that's long. Sao Paulo is the largest city in this hemisphere. We'll just say North America, okay? God has a plan for you, and it's not for you to come here once a week to do what we are doing right now. There is an education that you need in order to do the things that we're called. Now, listen to this. Now, again, you saw in, in this concept, I'm sorry, in my sermon title, the fit man. Who is the fit man? Who is the fit man? Who? Jesus is the fit man. Uh, there is a misconception that, um, that there's going to be a group of people uh, called the last generation of Seventh-day Adventists that are going to um, um, finish this whole work. That's a lie. Okay? That's from the pit of hell. That's not true. Jesus, the second Adam, is going to end this. He's our priest, and he's our prophet. He's everything. He's the great physician. He's our all in all. Again, because we have not been reading for ourselves, because we've not been praying and studying together, you know that this church is supposed to be praying daily for the work to be done. In the book of prayer, it says the church should be, and its members should be praying daily so that the work that they are doing in the community can be advanced, that, they can, that God will grant them grace to do the work that's there. Now, this sounds like a believing church, but it says in, 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 in paragraph 5, if there are only two or three people in a place that believe the truth, that they should do this work, coming together daily to pray for the salvation of souls, don't make up any excuses. Oh, it's too early. Okay. Then when Jesus gets here, it's going to be too early for you. Okay. Think about it. See with Pakam. Parabellum. If you want peace, if you want peace in this life and peace in the life to come, you have to prepare for war. We're here to prepare you for war. Again, what we have to do together is a special work. Listen to what it says about the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In a special sense, the Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world on them, on us, is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message. You know that most young people I know don't know those things. They don't know the three angels' message. But that's the work that they were born and created to actually spread to the world. There is no other work of so, so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Testimonies 9, page 45, paragraph 3. Okay? Nothing else is supposed to absorb our attention. SDA Bible commentary, listen to what it says. Mother, father, wife, children, houses, land, everything is to be counted secondary to the work and cause of God. Everything. Now notice, the most important relationships in a human being's life are listed. The most important material things, houses, land, are listed. There's nothing in commerce or in business or in your family life that should take precedence to this. Now I'm not telling you to leave your wife to do this work, or your husband, or your family. No, that's, that's ridiculous. But your family's supposed to be doing the work with you. Not supposed to be doing it separately. Listen to what it says. Special authority has been given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. God has invested his church with special authority and power. We've been given all power to finish this work on this planet. But again, Esau did not respect 
the privilege of his birthright. This is a part of our birthright as Seventh-day Adventists, and we don't understand it, and we don't acknowledge that we've been given all power. It goes on and it says, it says, God has bestowed the highest power under heaven upon this church. It is the voice of God and his united people in church capacity, which is to be respected. So when the church and business session makes a decision, one person can't say, well, I'm going to, I'm not going to participate, I'm not going to give money, I'm not going to contribute to that chair that we need. That's selfishness. It's not about you. This is not about you. This is about us working for our Father in heaven. Listen to this. This is taken from Acts of the Apostles, uh, Apostles page 9, paragraph 1. It says, the church is God's agency for the salvation of man. The church was created for service, not church service or lip service, but for the service to humanity. And we have to organize in order to do that. Again, Isaiah 58 talks about cry aloud, spare not, lift your voice like a trumpet. It goes on and it says, show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. We have sinned and continue to sin against God. You can say what you want to say about your upbringing, your life. God has a better life for you once you choose to step into the center of his will. Until you do that, you will continue like me. This is, this is my fifth career change. I was in corporate. I was working for GE, selling their stuff. Then I, I became a school teacher. Then I realized that public education in urban settings is a scam and it's designed to hurt people that look like us poor people specifically. It's not designed for our greater good. Yeah, they let a few like me slip in or slip out, but that's not enough. Um, then after that, I went to the nonprofit because I've always wanted to find out how I can help my people on 138th Street and 8th Avenue and, there, and the environs thereof. Um, again, that, that, that's a scam too. So then, 